Okay, welcome to uh, this, this episode of the Akkad and Coco Report. Uh, we are uh, incredibly uh, happy today to have Rafael Fonseca and John Tucker joining us today to talk about uh, uh, drug prescribing, uh, uh, specifically uh, uh, lunches, marketing to physicians by pharmaceutical companies, and how that may influence uh, physician uh, behavior. Uh, John and Raphael wrote a uh, uh, quite a data-driven uh, blog on the healthcareblog.com and, uh, and uh, it's a wonderful piece that we'll link to in the show notes and uh, we wanted to uh, uh, discuss it with you folks. Before we get started, I just want to, we're going to uh, talk a little bit about who Raphael and John are. So Raphael, why don't, why don't you start? Raphael, who, uh, what, where, uh, where are you practicing right now? Sure. Well, first of all, thank you for having me here. Yeah. I'm actually a hematologist and oncologist. I uh, work at the Mayo Clinic in Arizona. I'm a professor of medicine at the Mayo Clinic in Arizona. Uh, and I actually specialize in an area where, where patients do experience quite a bit of pain, which is multiple myeloma. That's 100% of my practice and my, my uh, clinical research. So that's, that's what I focus on. Ah, I see. And how, and how did it, uh, and, and prior to being at uh... Uh, at uh, Mayo in Arizona, where where did you get where did you go to medical school? So I actually went to medical school where I was uh, raised. That was in Mexico City. So ah. I finished uh, medical school in Mexico City. Um, as, as you know, in other countries, six years post high school. Um, I finished in 1991, and then I went to the University of Miami, where I pursued residency training in internal medicine. And subsequent to that, I went to Mayo Clinic in Rochester, where I, I obtained training in hematology and oncology. And ever since, uh, stayed working here for the Mayo Clinic. Ah, okay, wonderful. Now, what what is the setup like in the in uh, Arizona? This is the Mayo Clinic in Arizona. How, how does that how does that work? Is it a Mayo Clinic owned hospital? Yeah, we're we're actually our one enterprise. So we have three uh, large sites plus some some community hospitals in the um, in the Midwest. But you know, we're we're all part of the one Mayo Clinic. You know, we have uh, common governance. We have common protocols. Uh, so, so the two outposts uh, grew out of the necessity of continuity of care for patients who are coming down here in the winter, the snowbirds, and the same was true for Florida, and that's how it all started. But now we're a full-fledged hospital. Uh, you know, I, I, I prob- probably shouldn't toot our own horn, but just today we had the, the ratings for U.S. World of News, and uh-huh. you know what was now a, uh, was, was in its time a small hospital. Now we come out at the 11 nationwide Mayo Clinic in Arizona, so we're, you know. Very proud of a lot of the progress that has been made here. Wow, wonderful! So you're you're a uh, you're, it's an, an academic uh, enterprise. Uh, you would you would classify yourself as is that is that? Oh correct? yes, Mayo is a is a private institution, but it's a you know not for profit academic enterprise. In fact, our our logo are the three shields: so research, education, and clinical care. But you know, as always, a central one is clinical care. I think that's really the core of Mayo Clinic. And, and your interest in opioids and uh, uh, so, so, uh, your, your interest in this particular uh, uh, article, the article we'll, we'll get to in a bit, was on uh, opioid prescribing and marketing to physicians and how that would affect uh, uh, you know, uh, prescribing of opioids. Do you have a particular interest in that because of uh, you deal with a lot of pain patients? Well, you know, partly, I, I think I, my interest sort of opioids are a little bit of an innocent bystander. My interest has been very longstanding in understanding the um, scientific principles and some of the assertions that have been made over the years regarding the whole thing with conflict of interest. Mm-hmm. Actually, going back to 2009, working with a good friend and colleague, John, uh, Tom Stossel, we actually created an organization called Acre, where we wanted to uh, create a counterpoint for, for the common narrative that, you know, these doctors can be duped and somehow, you know, you walk out with a slice of pizza and uncontrollably you start, start prescribing, you know, the the product that was presented at such a meal. So, so I had a long interest and more than an interest and irritation with this, I would say yeah, yeah. something that just never, never, never made sense to me. And as you will explore later in the show, I just was incredibly fortunate to come across the friendship with, with John, who now actually has developed the tools that tell us you were right. So I, I've just, just, it's been a, a, a great interest. So in a way the opioids are a, an innocent bystander, although I deal with this all the time, you know, patients and, and their families are, everyone is concerned. No one wants to get opioids, even when they're clearly medically indicated for the management of pain. 
Yeah, I know. I'm particularly partial to white pizza. You know, if I get white pizza out of lunch, I'm just you know, irresistibly <laughs> start prescribing. You know. <laughs> I, know, well, that, I know. That's great. So, so, so the, the conflict of interest stuff that. Uh, it, the In fact, the only study I would suggest we do it is with wraps. I think wraps should be forbidden. It's one of the few things that my my liberty streak like prohibits because I think they're soggy, wet, herby tacos. So if actually I went to a drug launch that they prescribe wraps, I probably would be negatively predisposed <laughs> to prescribe that. Uh, that's, that. That'll be John's next uh, data-driven task. <laughs> so John, uh, John, uh, is it John Tucker is also joining us. And John, tell, tell me a little bit about uh, yourself. What are you doing now? And uh... Well, I, I, my training is as a medicinal chemist. I think people you know, mostly know that. Um, I worked in large pharma and I worked in biotech and I've worked in CROs and the last few years I've been more consulting both for uh, small biotechs and uh, also a little bit in the financial industry because one of the things that that I always found striking is that people deep in discovery research in the pharmaceutical industry very often don't seem to know anything about what's actually going on in the clinic and why drugs fail in the clinic and, and, and what the profile of drugs needs to be. And I got interested in that fairly early on, and that's, that's kind of leveraged in recent years. A little bit more work with, you know, financial organizations and funds that are interested in trying to understand whether clinical trials are likely to work or not. And, uh, uh, so a little bit of a balance between those two things. I also have a uh, small antibiotic company, Caladisi Therapeutics, and we've been working on some uh, approaches to novel classes of antibiotics for hospital-acquired gram-negative infections. Uh, at the moment, that's not going real smoothly, but you know we're hoping it'll pick up. All right. Well, and, and how do you? How are you interested in this particular? Uh, why? Why are you part of this uh, brain trust that wrote this uh, this article? Well, I, I think a lot of that just comes from the fact that you know as chemists i think you know we're, we're physical scientists but we're not in a field that's really hardcore like physics where things are completely predictable but we do get pretty quick answers back on whether our theories are correct or not and and chemists as a group i think tend to be very data driven and we if we fall in love with a theory that isn't correct and we bulldoze ahead in spite of bad data, we get punished. And we get punished fairly quickly by, by physical reality. We don't get what we want. And so I've always been very interested in this issue of, of uh, how do we understand the world around us? How do we objectively look at data? And, and frankly, in some ways, a little bit shocked at, at the extent to which a lot of stuff shows up in the literature that that really seems to be more advocacy than than an objective uh, analysis of the data, which I was always taught was what science is all about, and so it's it's a little bit of a philosophical interest and and uh, so you're a belief for what the world should be. Uh, so so you're a Renaissance man that came across uh, something that uh, didn't quite fit uh, the data and uh, and 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 you took it you you you, you took it upon yourself to kind of take a deeper look. So let's let's we'll dive into the paper. Um the paper is uh was in uh, 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 JAMA and the paper was by um uh, the first author was uh, Hadland. Um and they they, you know, they they're trying to look at the relationship between um, uh, what the pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical company does in terms of marketing to physicians and how physicians uh, prescribe um, uh, drugs. They specifically did this by, and again, you guys are definitely the experts on this. If I say something wrong, please let me know and please interrupt me. Um, they they looked at um, physician level data from the 2014 CMS Open Payments Database. Um, and they also looked at, I believe, the Medicare opioid prescribing database. And their hypothesis was that meals and other payments will increase physician opioid prescribing. Um, and they try and they examined the, the, the relationship between the two. And, and what they found was an almost uh, linear relationship between the number of opioid uh, manufacturer provided meals uh, uh, that were accepted by a physician and the number of opioid prescriptions that were uh, written. 
Um, they have a figure. Um, I'm going to try to uh, see if this works. I'll try to share the screen here to show that. And then I'll talk through it for our folks that are on the podcast. Um, okay, let's see here. All right, share screen. So there, what you can see here, can you guys see this? Yep. Yes. So this is the, this is the figure that was, uh, uh, this is the figure one of, 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 the, uh, of the paper where it looks at opioid prescription claims in 2015 for 25,000 physicians who received any industry meals uh, related to opioid marketing uh, during 2014. So 2014, they got meals. 2015, they're looking at prescribing 2015. So uh, on the uh, x-axis, the number of meals received and, and on the y-axis is the, uh, the number of opioid claims in 2015. And they appear to show, uh, what appears to show is a nice linear relationship between uh, the number of meals you got and the number of uh, opioid claims that were then ultimately prescribed in 2015. Um, uh, so that seems, that, that seems, let me figure out how I can stop sharing the screen. Um, Oh, there we go. Stop share. Sorry. So that seems. So that. I mean, that seems. That seems pretty strong. So what? Tell me. Can you guys uh, walk me through what you, what you thought about that figure uh, when you first saw it? Sure. I mean, you know, if 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 it's okay with you, maybe I can kind of first set the stage and then. Yeah, absolutely. Really, the the the, the big chunk of the statistical powerhouse comes from John, but. Yeah. You know, I, I think we've all been trained in, in science and statistical methods in medicine, but it seems that sometimes those principles are lost uh, when we do uh, research and, and uh, you know, stop thinking about what may be some of the confounding variables. And I, I think we have had for, for a significant amount of time a concern that some of these associations are really not something that people control for for simple things just as, you know, a specialty. You know, do you attend a meal if you're a pathologist, you don't, to take an extreme example, if you have a pain clinic, there's, there's a much higher likelihood that you're gonna be attending a meal like that. So it, it is really, uh, and, and as we will get into the data as, 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 as can be best described by John, we, we thought, you know, there, there, there needs to be some, some deeper thinking into what this actual um, uh, linear relationship is, was presented. Uh, means now uh, obviously one one of the things that that the, the most obvious and, and 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 first objection perhaps would be that is there a cause and effect or is this a simple correlation I think that's probably as simple as as, as we can put that because you know we would all want to know that I mean I would want to know that you know if if you get that white pizza that you refer to and you're somehow doing some some uh, erroneous or or nefarious prescribing. I think we would all agree as physicians that should be corrected. But the question is, is that really true? Is that, is that what you know, we are seeing? So we kind of started with, with um, perhaps some thoughts before we, we delved into the data of saying, you know, what is it really that we're looking at here? Are we, are we seeing just the ultimate demonstration of a quid pro quo where this, you know, and there's, there's this literature, which is very fussy, by the way. I don't think we need to get into that today regarding the you know, the, the you know, idea of, of this small gifts and then entice some reciprocation that perhaps in, in, in providing these meals, maybe, again, that influences in the, in the wrong way the, the, the uh, prescribing, so the quid pro quo, versus the specialty hypothesis or the hypothesis that somehow it's more of a reflection of those people that treat uh, pain patients. And you know, fortunately, up to this point, I think it was more than anything just a hypothesis. It was something that we kind of pointed out as a limitation of studies. There's similar studies that have been published in the past, but never really have the data to actually do an in-depth analysis and provide what I think is now quite um, an interesting uh, rebuttal to that uh, particular assertion. So, Rafael, you're saying you're saying that. Um... Uh, that uh, you know, you, you, this is they're showing a correlation here between a number of uh, um, meals accepted and and uh, um, the uh, 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 opioid prescribing that ultimately happens. Sure, but you're but you're but you're starting from this place of saying it seems like you're suspicious of it. You don't quite believe it. Why? Why do you think even before before we get to what John uh, what John's going to say? Why do you think that's not plausible? 
you know, I, I, I think I think it is it is plausible. But going from from the point that you say something, you know, that that you're showing, it's it's causative versus merely that simple correlation, which seems to be the very very first important step. Which again, in my mind, I don't think this has been done until this particular blog post that you know we we were able to do at the the healthcare uh, blog, and in fact. We, we, we wanted to explore three possibilities, talking about this possibility. So we said, you know, there, there's a possibility that you give a meal and that has no influence, right? So there's, there's no influence and we, we would call that as a neutral. There is a possibility that you have a meal and then you would have an influence. So that would be the first causative and, and, and we describe that in our in a table there in the, in the blog saying, but that influence may be a beneficial one. Let's say there's a new medicine that saves people from heart attacks and everyone should be getting it so that you and I and everyone would agree you should get that medicine right so that's what we call positive marketing now there's a third possibility that would say that you go to this meals and then you you inappropriately prescribe because it's the wrong medication there's a cheaper alternative or something so we have those those three tiers right but we haven't even gotten beyond the first tier which is is this really something that is influencing that behavior and, and at this point, I think it's just all, you know, conjecture. It's just, just trying to, to look at these correlations. And, and this paper and, and, and several previous ones have gone as far as saying, given our findings, and despite all of them have some vague language regarding the lack of cause and effect association, they go on and they prescribe recommendations of things, you know, policy, et cetera, that should be. Right, should be. right. What I'm getting at, what I'm getting at, Rafael, is that there, there's a pre-existing, there's, there's a pre-existing prior whenever these folks write their papers and when it is you come at, when, when you come at it. So that's mm-hmm. one of the things is, is why, why do you feel, you clearly, before even getting to the paper, feel that, look, this is unlikely that this is happening because of your personal experiences, because of, uh, of whatever, whereas these other folks clearly feel much, much different. So the question is, why do they have these different pre-existing beliefs um, is, 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 is certainly an interesting one because, uh, because you know, and that's a hard, <laughs> harder question to answer. But well, oh, yeah. well, 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 there's, yeah. there's an a priori hypothesis. And I start, yeah. I mean, first from, the, from the, the personal experience, and if you made the anecdote, I just, just have a hard time believing that someone who's gone through such extensive training would be so easily swayed. Um, and, and some of this are, we're talking about one meals versus two meals. And Joe can give you an example of a, right. another paper where it was three meals, but not four meals. And it just, it just didn't make intuitive sense that that right. would be right. right. And so that would be number one. The second one is, I think, I think uh, it, it's, it's uh, something that, you know, we, we, we've observed and I think others have observed over the years that there's just this negative predisposition towards the private sector, particularly within academic medicine. And, and, and there's a number of reasons, and, and there's some history that there's some, you know, bad apples and there's some bad stories, but that has permeated almost into an ethos in medicine that, you know, thou shall start by, by seeing anything that comes from the private sector as suspect. And I go like, well, really, I mean, I live in a world, I, I mentioned I live in the world of myeloma, where, you know, we've been very fortunate and have been able to change the lives of patients because of our partnership with the private sector. So really something didn't add up. And, and that's what kind of raises that little flag in the background of saying, you know, is that skepticism something that is truly justified or, you know, do we have enough evidence to start behaving, to continue to behave in such a way? Right, right. right. No, that, that's great. Those are, that's, that's, those are important points. That's what I was trying to get at in terms of why, why do you believe uh, uh, differently uh, a priori? But, but so, so, John, tell me what you thought about uh, figure one or, or rather, you know, how did you... Well, uh, did you... I think approaching... Yeah. This issue in general, yeah. I, I I found the size of the effect that they were proposing a little implausible. Uh, basically, the joke I always make is is that California is going to pass a law forbidding physicians onto automobile dealers dealerships unless they're escorted by someone because the salesperson is going to talk them into buying six SUVs. You know, I don't think that people are really that gullible. And I really don't see a $15 lunch. I really don't see physicians with the salaries that they are, that it, it seems very likely that their prescription pad is for sale for $15. It's just, it just restrains credulity a little bit. I will say that I was actually expecting to see some effect, which I thought would be much smaller. Than, than than what the paper was suggesting, and was actually pretty surprised to find 
virtually no effect at all. Um, so, so I, I think there's 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 that aspect to it, and and again, the thing that immediately just jumped out at me is is you have a graph and you have chronic pain specialists. I saw a chronic pain specialist a couple of times uh, about ten years ago, and he was not a rich man who was passing out opioids like candy and to, to drug addicts. He was working in one of the most modest offices that I've ever seen. He had a practice that consisted mainly of Medicaid patients. And he took his job very, very seriously. And I don't think he was making a lot of money. The man really, in my mind, is in many ways a hero. And, and, and so I, I want to see things like that respected too. Um, maybe that's a good place to stop. Yeah. No. No. So, so the question is. So the question is that. Uh, so I'm going to share what, uh, how. Uh, and, and, and I guess I, I think mm-hmm. the central point I would like yeah. to make is, I don't think it really matters. Right. What your preconceptions are going in. Right. But you have to look at the data and you have to come in and you have to be willing to change your mind right. when you encounter data that conflicts with whatever your preconception was. So it's okay to have preconceptions. Right, right. right. It's yeah. perfectly, everybody has preconceptions, but, but I think that the central issue is to be open to the data yeah. rather than using your opinions to decide what data to and that, that's absolutely right. Uh, so the, the, that's absolutely right. So, you, you, but you know, we, it's, it's always good to know where what, what starting points you have and why you have those starting yeah. points. And then, and we're, we're going to get right now to what uh, you know how you uh, how you interpreted that figure, which seemed relatively, or at least seemed to show a pretty clear correlation um, of uh, uh, opioid uh, uh, lunches and uh, uh, and prescriptions. So here is John, what you showed. Bear with me here. And so here we have, you guys can see that? Correct. So John, so walk us, walk us through what you're showing uh, you're here and, and, how you, um, and how you did this. Well, I, I think that one of the first things that I was concerned about, uh, as, as Raphael mentioned, was the issue of confounding by specialty. And, and we addressed that separately. But I think the second issue that would really struck me about that graph in the Hadland paper is it was a very non-standard presentation of data. Usually if one is looking at the dependence of a variable on a second variable, you do a scatter plot. And the scatter plot like this, it shows you all the data points and it allows you to see not only is there a slope or an overall dependence, but it allows you to see uh, how significant of a contributor that uh, that independent variable is on the dependent one. So by breaking the data up into uh, slices and taking averages and standard deviations and then taking the standard deviation and converting it to a standard error. The Hadland paper gives an impression that the primary driver of opioid prescribing is lunches. But in fact, what we show in this graph is, is that people who accepted no lunches prescribed between 10 and 10,000 times in 2015, as did those who accepted 40 lunches. Right. So, so it's, not a, it's not a big driver it's not a, a, of the overall picture. So when you t- so when you took the same raw data and uh, and instead of categorizing it like the Hadland folks did, right? The, and they categorized it in number of meals and and whatnot. And you and you just put up a scatter plot. What you see here is a utter, you know, a scatter plot with with really nothing that you can really call as even correlative. Is that would that be? Uh, well, in, in, in this particular graph, there's, there's R squared is usually considered to be a measure of, of how much of the variation in the Y axis is due to variation in the X axis of the dependent right. variable. R squared is eight. So about 8% of, of the variation here in, in 
uh, opioid prescriptions was related to the number of meals. And then the number of meals, of course, we have that issue of confounding by uh, specialty too. But I wanted to emphasize in this graph that, that no, this isn't a major driver of prescribing. Right. Other factors are much more important. Right. Right. No. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So it's it a nice it's a nice graph that that shows that and it shows you kind of uh, what what you can do when you uh, when you when you have something that's relatively continuous and the information loss that happens when you when you categorize variables as as they did you may you may create stronger correlations than what actually exist. Correct. Well. Um, Anish, I probably should have discussed this with you uh, before we, we had this uh, recording because I don't know if I'm maybe stepping beyond uh, what you wanted to do here. But I, That's I okay. guess one, no. of the, yeah. one of the issues that, that I was concerned about yeah. in the medical literature general and in this paper in particular was that any time there was a choice between two ways of presenting the data, right. it seemed to me as I went through it, that the JAMA paper chose the one that created the appearance of a very large effect. And we get into the issue of, um, which I think is a fascinating issue in and of its own and a very important one is, is what is the appropriate place for advocacy and, and does advocacy belong in medical journals because in some ways, I've always traditionally thought of science as being to try to parse data as objectively as possible, whereas the role of advocacy is more to convince and, and you present the data in the way that helps you make your point. And right. Yeah, so no, I, I, think, I think that's a critical issue. Yeah, no, and that's that's that was going to be my next uh, question to uh, both of you. Why it does clearly seem like over and over and over again we are we keep getting hit over the head with uh, more and more data that seems to build this impregnable evidence base that suggests that yes, physician uh, as a payments to physicians from pharma is causing uh, deleterious effects uh, when actually the actual evidence. Uh, is incredibly weak now most physicians don't don't have the don't have the time or the ability to do what you've done john in terms of nicely showing that certainly whatever effect there may be is way weaker than what is at least posited in these papers but uh, but certainly a large number of physicians like me and raf are somewhat aghast and, and, and you know <laughs> are somewhat incredulous by this idea that these lunches do have the large effect sizes um, uh, uh, that they do. Um, so it's just, it represents to uh, at least us practicing physicians, this ever widening gulf between folks that are uh, in academia hold these very strong views uh, versus, you know, versus, versus us. Um, and, and it gets, and it gets back to the beautiful thing that you said earlier, which is, which is, it seems very, very, very hard to, move pre-existing biases with data um and then and i think you've very you've nicely shown you know in the way you in the way you demonstrate in the way you uh, displayed the data and the, um uh, that uh, certainly it, it, it's much murkier than what's otherwise uh, believed um wh why do you think raf that this um uh, why do you think folks uh, in folks? Why, why do you think journals um, that are supposed to be so objective? Why do you think they have uh, taken this uh, taken sure. this unshakable stance? You know, I I think there's a, there's a couple of concepts that probably apply here. One is this idea of the cascade of avail you know, availability, cascade of things that are common, and the flow of a common narrative, you know, by its mere existence in time becomes reality, right? And then that reality sort of forges what things are or what things should be. And then uh, the second concept is this whole notion of cognitive dissonance, right? It's like you're, you're shown data and, and, and uh, as I think the data, then we'll, we'll get maybe a little bit more into that as, as our discussion goes on. It's very hard to refute. The data is very strong, but it's just emotionally hard for people to accept this. So the, so the common narrative um, is that, again, there's, there's some, some, uh, 
evil behind everything that has to do with the private sector. Now, in this case, it applies to opioids. So how do you translate that? Well, you could articulate that by saying, one, it was, you know, greedy pharmaceutical companies that do doctors. Number two is doctors who take meals are, are you know, um, in, in some way being influenced by this. And of course, ultimately, this contributes to the opioid epidemic. So this is, you know, chapter 19 of the story of industry is evil. This is uh, the chapter 19 is the, the opioid example of that evilness of, of industry. And I think what is remarkable, I think, is what John said. You know, we, we all have our own biases. We all have our own uh, perceptions and uh, ideology. But I think we should all be con convinced by, by, by science and by data. And one of the things that strikes me the most is that some of the people that are so ardent supporters of evidence-based medicine, people that would probably, if they stuck to their narrative, would forego still somewhat new treatments because we still don't have the Cochrane review or the phase three trial, and, and, and to their credit, a lot of this is, is you know, is based, and I, I know it's debatable whether that's beneficial or not, but it's based at least on a framework of statistical rigor, seem to just throw that out the window when it comes down to the, some this publications that become critical of, of, of the private sector. So I think, I think it's just that it forms part of that flow of information, that narrative that is really, really very hard. And I would say so it's risky for someone to deviate from that. Uh, because you know how how could you be saying such a thing? Yeah, I I I, I have trouble understanding why why there, why those folks are so unshakable. At, at the very least, you know, folks like me say you know it, it's murky and it's very hard to stridently say any one thing. <laughs> sure. But but these go these these folks don't say well it, you know it's confusing and yes there may be some influence but no they say very clearly this is all done and and it's all deleterious. We don't even have by the way data to suggest that even if you are influencing folks, right? Um, if you are influencing folks, how do you know, as you guys said, how do you know that you're not influencing stuff in a net positive way? We have no idea. So the same folks that are so dead set on clinical outcomes and saying, well, we need, an, we need, a, uh, we need to know if the outcomes are worse. I mean, what, I mean where, <laughs> all you've shown is that, yes, you may influence physicians, exactly. but you haven't necessarily shown that any outcomes are significantly worse, but anyway, I, I, I yeah. So it's a great point. I, I, I want, I, I want to, I, I want to get back to um, a couple, two other points, uh, two other you know data-driven points here that you guys uh, uh, showed, which I think are important. One, I, I won't do it in order. Is is this in terms of pushing back against this narrative? In terms of you know, uh, you know, folks that are listening are, are maybe incredulous and say, well, how can you not believe that pharmaceutical companies influence uh, us in a, in, a, in, a, in a significant way? Well, if that is the case, then, then the relationship between the number of opioid prescriptions written and the total payments received, maybe that should be something significant, correct? So if, if you're, you know, if, uh, it, it, you know, you should be able to show that the person who is getting $15 from pharma uh, is prescribing fewer fewer prescriptions than the person who's getting thirty thousand dollars from pharma, correct? And so you guys also did a um, yeah, you guys also took a look at that, and let me show that. You guys can all see that, correct? Right. And this looks at the relationship between the number of opioid prescriptions written and total payments received, and it's a total total mess, meaning there's absolutely no well, I don't know, John. Am I? I mean, this looks this looks like no no correlation at all, correct? Between folks that at the now, lower scale. I, I, I will admit scale. we did we did find an effect in these. Okay. Uh, putting that correlation line is point oh nine eight for <laughs> for for every fifteen million dollars spent, an additional ten prescriptions were written. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I stand corrected. <laughs> So it again it it again makes this point it's like well, how how can how can folks so stridently say it given given what we're seeing i mean the vast majority of prescriptions that are being that are being uh, the, sorry the vast majority of stuff that's going out is these low dollar low dollar low dollar meals and it seems like there's not much return of investment whether you're giving somebody a 15 dollar lunch whether you're paying somebody $30,000, right? 
You know, one of, one of the things that was very interesting during, after we had this release, of course, as you can imagine, that there were, mm-hmm. the mod was flying yeah. uh, our way. Yeah. And, you know, and, and, and I can understand that people have different perspectives on this. For some, for some people, it's no matter what, you know, the data will show, they would still think right. of this as something negative, something that shouldn't exist. Right. Right? So, so there was a, one of the, the comments on Twitter was, oh, this is just bribing. And I think one of the best responses I saw that day was one that John said, which was, well, if it's, if it's a bribe, I can tell you it's not working. <laughs> and, and, you know, honestly, to, to have such an investment, the return on investment, if there is any reason for this to be suspended, it shouldn't come from policymakers. It shouldn't come from pharmaceutical companies that are saying, gee, you know, we're not getting the return on investment for, for what we're seeing here. Now, there are some limitations, and we wouldn't claim that this findings apply to every single other relationship or every other study. But at least if you, if, if you use this as a test case, I think it shows for the first time, and again, I'm not aware that this has been previously shown, that in fact those concerns are 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 uh, you know based on 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 the the real concern that this confounding variables will not allow you to reach uh, conclusions in that regard. Right. The other very smart way I thought you guys showed you guys looked at this was to look at um, uh, at uh, prescriptions uh, at the relation between uh, opioid prescriptions written and and meals that were paid for by non-opioid pain treatment. So we have things like spinal cord stimulators or, or other types of mechanical ways that you have of trying to reduce pain, right? And so you guys did, a, did a, I thought we were very smart to look at um, the relationship between the uh, 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 number of meals that are paid for by non-opioid manufacturers Right and opioid prescriptions, and you guys showed, you guys showed a, showed a positive relation there, and so how would how would that make sense, right? Um, I mean, it, it does actually make sense, but it makes sense because it suggests that folks that are going to a lot of lunches and meals and conferences about pain, those folks end up prescribing more pain med- more pain medications, right? Um, am, I, am I am I getting your I'm, I'm getting the gist and the argument correctly? Hopefully. Yes. Yeah, so so and just just for a comment, I don't know if the screen refreshed, but there's there's another graph that reflects that the the one the opioids uh, prescribe according to the meals paid by St. Jude's, which you know yeah. the value yep, yep. That's what I'm showing right here. Do you see that figure four? Um, yeah, we have figure four up right now, but you referred you were referring to the other graph, and I guess we were wondering why that one wasn't up. Yeah, if you want to go up a little bit higher, oh, just for okay, this, okay, folks who are seeing that, the, uh, yeah, go down a little, just a little bit further. You know, as, as we get there, maybe I can just just uh, yeah, say yeah, the, yeah. the the yeah. the narratives uh, be, behind this was that, you know, we we sort of postulated that in fact that the the um, you know if if indeed it was a practice association, pro- I, I would say that's probably the most powerful figure in the in in in, in this write up was that the number of meals paid by someone who didn't make oh. opioids correlate exactly. That's a, that's a feature. Sorry, you yeah. see that that really correlates. I mean, that, that's even a tighter correlation with that one of the ones of the meals provided by opioid manufacturers. In fact, there were, there were other similar observations that were made with other drugs. Uh, sometimes, you know, some of the drugs could be produced by a company that indirectly also, you know, uh, maybe uh, produces an opioid. So those were, 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 maybe a little bit more uh, more difficult to fully explain. But you have here a device manufacturer that shows you exactly the same correlation. Right. I think this graph in and of itself is probably, you know, it's a stake to the heart of the argument that the number of meals uh, influences prescribing by the yeah. opioid manufacturers. Right, absolutely. So th- this is a graph for the folks on the podcast. This is a graph that shows the number of meals on the x-axis and then average number of prescriptions on the y-axis. And as you, the number of meals goes up that are that are being given by uh, uh, St. Jude, which is a, a medical device company that treats pain. So this is non-opioid treatments. As you get more meals from St. Jude, look at that. Um, the number of opioid prescriptions goes up as well. So again, points to the fact that the reason you have this correlation is because the folks that are being targeted uh, are, are, you know, are the folks that are being targeted and the folks that are prescribing more opioids are folks that deal a lot with pain. Folks that are, you know, have large pain population, you know, pain patient populations and, and whatnot. So again, uh, you know, I, I, very, very smart way of showing 
showing all of this stuff. So um, uh, show, showing that you know this this whole causal relation between uh, uh, pharmaceutical um, uh, marketing and, and 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 prescriptions is is, is very tenuous and weak. Um, so. Uh, now, to, to, so you guys wrote this wonderful paper. You actually submitted it as a response to the JAMA Hadlin's paper, and and what and what happened? Can either of you chime in and tell us what happened? Sure, John. Do you want to take a stab at it? Yeah, I, I think you were the one who, who did that interaction. So I'll, okay, I'll so I'm happy happy to do it. Thanks. So 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 we saw this paper. And, 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 you know, it sort of raised some eyebrows and we thought you, I, we better do the analysis. And, and I think I, bef before I fully explain the steps with the letter, I just have to give credit to, to, to uh, you know, Jones with an intelligence and saying, hey, listen, we have the database and we have the same payments. Why don't we look for those confounding variables so that we can do this, this correlation? And, you know, we sent an abridged version of this report, uh, but that abridged version, you know, the message was very, very clear. It was a letter to the editor that refuted the central findings of that study. I think in, in, you know, in, in a regular scientific environment, uh, you would imagine that that's something you wanna have further dialogue on. Um, at this point, and, and I, don't, I, I think I, you know, I, I, I still stand on that thought is that you know, we, I cannot, cannot say that there's ill intent. I can think maybe there's, there's oversight, maybe there's uh, you know, this, this, this bias in favor of or this cognitive dissonance, but we send this letter and, and this letter was rejected, you know, and they get a number of letters, but you would imagine if you're an editor again, you think, gosh, this is, this is so central to what is being said. I think I should consider this, this with some, some great priority, right? Um, the letter was rejected. So we got a letter of rejection and, and, and subsequent to that, we decided that we needed to share these findings because this is obviously important as, as people continue to, to try to figure out solutions for the opioid crisis. And, and as this got rejected, um, there, a couple of thoughts started you know, going through our mind. Well, first of all, we, we, we know the authors, and, and, and again, we're assuming everything is done with, with, with good intent, but we know the authors kind of missed it. I mean, it was, it was an obvious thing that should have been tested. Then we thought the reviewers missed it too as well, because you know, if, if anyone who's, who's doing a careful reviewer and others people worth, if you're worth your salt as a reviewer, you gotta say you have to give me more than a correlation. You know, if 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 I if I presented a similar correlation to show a drug of benefit and survival, I think I would be very be very very quickly shut down. Right? You're 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 not giving me enough data to be convincing. And obviously, the editorial staff uh, didn't didn't get it. So there were three layers of oversight, which again could be a rush review, etc. But but you know, just made our concern grow when we now had a letter to the editor that was rejected. And, and, and again, we, we, we went on and we published that. Uh, we did reach out to the, to the authors of the paper asking to see if we could have access to the primary data. And we got a, a prompt response from them. We said, you know, we, we would like to have your data. We offer ours in return. And we were told the data would be available at some point in the future, pending a publication of another article along this, this, this line. So and we haven't received that uh, so far. Um, but of course, being being concerned about this, we thought, gee, we you know we we would like to explore this further. Well, as our paper uh, uh, was presented in the healthcare blog, uh, it got some notoriety on social media, and and uh, another member of the editorial board of the of the journal kind of got word of it, and stated, well, you know, this is interesting. Maybe this should be submitted as a full report as a letter to the editor. Uh, we pointed out it had been submitted, it had been rejected, and, and didn't hear anything after that particular point. So with that persistent concern, we have sent a letter to the, to the editor-in-chief of the, of the journal expressing some of our, some of our um, uh, uh, perspectives and, and, again, wanting to have this very uh, uh, thoughtful scientific dialogue we would like the opportunity to, 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 to have this be heard or, or you know, thoughts about correction for this. And we haven't gotten a response to this point. Now that's uh, about uh, two or three weeks ago. <laughs> it, it's really, really fascinating that that it's allowed to the the paper is allowed to stand without some without uh, without any mention of a very strong rebuttal in peer review, and it just goes to show you what a problem the peer reviewed. Is this new? What's that? Is this new? 
Is this is this, has have is the medical <laughs> literature always been this way, or or is this something new? I mean, I mean, I'm I'm awakening to the bias. I mean, I didn't, yeah, I honestly didn't realize how much bias there was. I think, and and, a, and and what's really notable is the selective skepticism, right? That that people wanted to go over our paper with a fine tooth comb and point out, well, did you look at this? 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 But not a single person who reviewed the paper in shame said, well, you've shown a correlation here, but you threw pain specialists in with gynecologists. And of course, pain specialists are going to go to more meals and prescribe more opioids than gynecologists. Right. You know, and John, I can tell you, this is not new. I'll give you a couple of examples. I mean, first of all, there's a couple of papers in the same journal, one looking at statins prescription. I, I, I wrote a brief blog about this, but of course, never had the data as, we, as, as you were able to, to, to show here, you know, with the same concerns. There's, a, there's a, a couple of other papers, one that looks, for instance, at, at people who get payments from the manufacturers of certain drugs that are used for the treatment of blood cancers without realizing that in private practices, usually there's a, f a, a few folks that are in charge of heme malignancies versus the rest of the oncology practice that takes charge of the, of the solid tumors. But perhaps the most telling example, let me, let me just, just mention one briefly. Um, uh, Tom Stossel, a few years back, was concerned that journals would have this negative predisposition towards the private sectors when, when this was all in the midst of the conflict of interest you know, conversation. So he actually took a literature analysis with uh, this fellow named Roman Lesko, and they looked at all the articles that were published regarding conflict of interest in medicine. And then they contrasted that with articles that were being uh, presented regarding stem cell research, which was also a highly controversial topic, right? And what they found is that the literature in stem cell research always presented uh, uh, that, you know, th those papers in the literature on stem cell research always presented the two sides of the coin. Whereas all of the articles that were talking about conflict of interest in medicine were predominantly focused on the negative aspects of interaction of academia and medicine. This was clearly shown. Well, I can tell you this article made the rounds in many prominent journals. In fact, I talked to a few of the editors and some of them in private would say, we just cannot publish this. You know, the data stands, but we just cannot publish this. It was ultimately published in 2015 in Nature Biotechnology. And I invite those that are listening to, to this podcast to read, to read uh, that paper. But it, it, it really showed, it didn't show what, what we're showing here regarding, regarding the effect, but it showed, I think, conclusively that there was this, this, this conflict of interest that, that was in, intrinsic to the journals that was just completely aligned with the narrative of the private sector is just a bad thing. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's really fascinating that there are certain topics that seem to be unmentionable, or there's, sorry, there's certain topics that uh, you can't present both sides. There's certain topics that there is apparently settled fact, and it's like, it's like a dirty word that you can't say on, on live TV. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> if, you, if you do this. Um, what, what, what was the, you know, so before I escape, before people accuse me of giving you guys too, too easy of a time, what was the strongest, would you say, uh, uh, rebuttal to your piece? Is there, was it, would you say that there's one particularly strong rebuttal to your piece that really stuck or that made sense? I thought there was a very, I'm sorry. I, Go ahead, John. Yeah, I thought one particularly good argument was made that if all this marketing isn't doing any good, why would companies do it? And, and I will say that, that one thing that we could not explore in our analysis was a breakdown of the distribution between generic products and brand products and between different brand products in competition with each other. And it'd be nice to have the data to look at that and, and look at it with an open mind. I think that the central thesis of that paper, however, which was that the opioid prescribing was, was overall was driven by uh, by these meals was, was pretty firmly rebutted. Yeah, no, that, that, that is a very good point. There's clearly something 
I mean, the market is saying that there's some reason why you want to, you need to get, you know, the pharmaceutical folks in the door talking to doctors because there must be some, some, some level of influence uh, that's, uh, that's, and, and you know, there, I mean, there's other limitations. You could, you, you know, apart from the, you know, the brand changes, you could say, well, maybe the big effect already occurred, and you know, you can, you've reached sort of a ceiling of how much you do it. I, I think there's some, some sort of more sort of far-fetched potential explanations. So I think what John states makes sense. You know, obviously, why, you know, why would there there be the the promotion of this? Uh, but 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 I think so far with the data that was presented in the paper, which which really has been the focal point of the analysis of the healthcare blog, not per se the ideology or the ethics or you know the the principle based perspective behind this, I don't think anyone has been able to convincingly refute what was presented. And if anything, I think what we do present are major weaknesses to the to the original analysis, which again apply to the vast majority of patients, the vast majority of papers that have been previously published. In this particular realm, uh, which you know, if, it doesn't take a lot of a lot of effort, but you start looking at them, and they're all essentially that correlation, no causation, and even if there was causation, you know, is it the right prescribing or the wrong prescribing? As an oncologist, I can tell you, I'm dealing with a lot of patients who who have a hard time accepting prescription for for opioids, and and this is all part of this narrative. This is kind of an after effect of this narrative that opioids are bad, and you know, you you should you should minimize them. So so I think there is a there's a there's a clear uh, potential for harm when we kind of lose that objectivity, particularly as, as uh, physicians and physician scientists. Uh, absolutely. And, and the thing is that we don't really, we, we have no idea whether or not uh, this particular mode of marketing physicians is necessarily ha- is, is bad. Um, I remember clearly, I mean, there's so many different examples I can give you, but I remember as a resident, Zygris, which is uh, activate protein C uh, uh, for, for sepsis. And, you know, there's a randomized control trial that showed there was some mortality benefit in folks that were severely ill. Uh, and, and I remember uh, the pharmaceutical uh, companies uh, fanning out and Zygris had these beautiful pens. There were these wonderful pens with these nice, you know, I, they, you know the pens were really important because we used to write so much as a resident. This is pre-EPIC, uh, pre-EMR. And you had this nice, you know, beautiful way that the pens would, would, would write on paper and they wouldn't stick and they wouldn't run out and blah, blah, blah. So I remember the Zygris pens clearly. But the reason we all prescribed Zygris, the reason that every single smarty pants like me sitting in, uh, you know, at 2 a.m. Uh, in some medical ICU and in, in front of some sick patient. The reason, the reason we were all sitting, putting, punching in the Apache score, which told us how sick the patient was. And if the patient was sick enough, you know, we would start Zygris. And the next morning when the attending would come, you know, we would, we would say, yes, you know, Dr. Dr. Kreiner, you know, uh, this patient's Apache score was 25 and I started, uh, and I started Zygris. It was not because of the pen. It was because of the guidelines in the New England Journal published an RCT that said that. And it turned out, that the study was <laughs> the study was BS and that there was all sorts of problems and I mean I, you know as a PGY whatever two or one resident I didn't have the wherewithal or the context in order to be able to see through that um, but you know guidelines changed a guideline said to do it and we did it and so I think the main I think the key thing here that is being that is a little bit lost is that we ha- regardless of where the influence peddlers come from and there's no question pharmaceutical companies want to are, are fanning out marketing folks to get you to prescribe their drug. But the key thing that has to, the message that has to go out to uh, physicians and trainees uh, is that we need to critically think about what is being told to us. We need to think about these things and come up with our own conclusions uh, uh, rather than just swallow uh, whatever is being, is what is being said to us. And, and we, we make this, and I think it's a major, 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 massive mistake if we say, all right, this influence peddler is bad and everything he says is bad. But you can, you can, you can if, if this influence peddler says something, everything he says is good and you can just do whatever it is he says. And, you know, it didn't take me too much. <laughs> it didn't take me a long time to figure out that that was really, really stupid. Um, so, so, yeah, I think, I think uh, you know, it's, it, it's, 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 it's a, your, your, the work that you both did is really wonderful in terms of, highlighting the fact that uh, uh, that all of us pr- need to kind of evaluate the data. Uh, uh, I think it's hard to do that. You yeah. Know, people are really busy. Right. Um, I tell people when they talk about the negative influence of sales reps that I call non-academic psycho- non-academic neurologists who treat MS and interviewed them 
three months before the launch of the dimethyl fumarate and after the key clinical trials have been published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Most of them hadn't heard of it. Now, in an ideal world, those doctors would read all the literature and they'd be on top of everything on their own and they wouldn't rely on influence peddlers at all. But the fact is, is that, that they have families and they have practices and, and, and sometimes just getting information from a multitude of different sources is, is you know, a good thing. Yeah, but you know, I, I wish I wish that voices like ours were uh, heard. I, I think it's true that thinking is very expensive, and you know who has the time to think about all of this? Uh, you know, best analogy: you're driving down the road, you don't want to know how your brakes work. You just want to make sure you put the pedal down, and the car is going to slow down, right? So the same is true for for what we do. But when someone points out that your brake pads are low, you better pay attention, right? So when someone points out that some of the studies are are, are really don't have the scientific rigor that they should have, I, I think I would like to see a little bit of a, of a greater response. I'll give you an example. In, in, in 2012, I believe, there was a study published in the New England Journal, included Dr. Kesselheim from the Harvard system, saying that doctors had a lower level of trust from, for clinical trials conducted by pharmaceutical companies. The magnitude was about 30%, give or take. And I wrote a letter to the editor, and I thought that was scandalous, because that means that but, but just using that arithmetic, 30% of people who were willing participants in clinical trials could consider that their effort was worthless. And the reason for that was just because there's this sort of intrinsic, uh, you know, um, the negativity or this is in, intrinsic paranoia against the private sector. So we actually are losing out on that 30% of those clinical trials. And when it comes down to marketing, the, the double standard is just, just incredible. You know, we, we see that if someone gives you that pen or gave you that pen, we don't get those pens anymore. Plus, we're on the EMR, which is another whole conversation all the time, right? But it, it, that, was, that was wrong. But, but you can see, you know, all medical centers have advertising budgets and we're out there, and, you know, promoting our services, etc. But it's like we're holier than thou. You know, that is okay for, 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 for academicians to do. Oh, but, oh boy, you do some direct-to-consumer advertising in pharma and that's, that's like just saying Voldemort. <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. No, this has been a great, great conversation. Any, any, we'll, we'll wrap up. Any, any last, uh, any last uh, thoughts, folks, in terms of uh, the paper or uh, or con uh, conference uh, conflicts of interest. Well, I, I, I would start just by saying uh, thank you for the interest. I think this is this is very uh, important work. I think. Uh, you know, we, we as, as you stated, want to see uh, innovation be more rapidly disseminated. And if these are some of the barriers for innovation, you know, name, namely the conflict of interest, I see that as a problem. Others have said it can take, you know, sometimes up to 15 years. I hope it's less for, for new medical things to actually get disseminated into the practice. And if that, that uh, sense of lack of trust in the private sector is doing that, I don't think that serves patients. So I think um, um, I, I'm hoping and, uh, that uh, John and I will tackle other similar papers in the future uh, to, to point out what really should be considered as, as, as we think uh, about the rhetoric regarding this, this ideology. Excellent. Raf, what, what, what's your uh, Twitter handle? Uh, it's rfonz1, at rfonz1. All right, wonderful. Like the, the, what was that TV show, the Fonzi? It's rfonz1. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> wonderful. John, any last any last thoughts? No, I, I think that uh, uh, there's a general issue here, and it can you know at, at different levels. One is that of uh, I think a little bit of an industry uh, anti-industry bias. Um, certainly, if we look at the reliable ability of trial results, for example, we find that most of the papers on retraction watch are from academia and not from industry. Industry is actually as Big Brother looking over its shoulder, pretty close. Um, but but maybe the broader issue and one that I'd really love to see you and Michelle take on sometime is the one of advocacy in medical journals and and the one the role of keeping science and politics separate. Because I'm I'm really quite concerned at, at the politicization of of the scientific literature. I think it. It's using your credibility, our credibility, for a, a, a purpose, but we're burning it. It's like we're burning, we're, we're burning our house down to stay warm. And 
so I see things like science Thanks. science magazine is now employing a a investigative journalist and is that really the role of a scientific journal I, I'm not sure about that I guess that, that would be no, that, that, that's an excellent point. It would definitely, definitely something that we have to bring up. But it's an excellent point because the more that, uh, uh, more that science involves itself in advocacy politics. in politics, uh, the, 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 you know, the more egg, the more egg on our face there is. So you don't need orange hued folks, um, at Pennsylvania Avenue, uh, labeling folks as fake news when you're doing it, you're doing a good job yourself. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. so, but, yeah. All right. Well, well, thanks so much for both of you for joining me for this last hour or so. I hope uh, it was great. Oh, John, uh, your, your, your Twitter handle uh, is what again? Uh, what is my Twitter name? John Tucker, PhD. PhDs in there really just because John Tucker and John A. Tucker were both taken. <laughs> All right. So, so definitely, definitely follow both these folks for, uh, for uh, for for a a, uh, a a different look for if you know if you want to get out of the echo chamber I'd say uh, you know Raf and John John are uh, are great great folks to follow on Twitter so thanks again folks all right okay thank, thank you for you. the invitation yep, absolutely.